good evening. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spooky 101. Today's episode featuring Mike Marin being buried alive at Spooky World is going to be a fun one, and we are really, really excited to bring that to you. We're grateful that Mike and his legendary DJ career were able to appear on this show, and we look forward to bringing that to you. A uh, couple of other things. Uh, as with everything, nothing is perfect. Um, unfortunately, on my end of this interview, I ran into a couple of audio issues. Uh, Mike came in perfectly. You will have no problem hearing him, and he's all you really want to hear anyways. Um, but you will be able to get through the interview. You'll be able to hear me uh, ask my questions and respond. But we have some pride here, and uh, I apologize. The rest of the interviews that we have in the can right now, which are probably about seven or eight, uh, are flawless. So on this interview, uh, out of respect for our audience and for Mike, I do apologize. I do have some good news, though. April 25th, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. You folks should make some time available that day. A certain film crew may be doing an interview on America's Hometown Horror podcast, live on Facebook and YouTube. We are more than happy to be able to bring you David, Quinn, and myself for a bit of a Q&A session with the great folks and great supporters of this film over at America's Hometown Horror. Please follow them on social media, subscribe to their podcast. They are bringing great, great material to you folks on a weekly basis. It's one of the better local horror podcasts, hopefully to be national someday, that I've heard. So without further ado, folks, let us bring in the interview with Mike Marin, Buried Alive. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce longtime radio personality, Mike Morin to the show. Mike, how are you today? I am doing fabulous. Thank you. Uh, when you say long time, you're right. Uh, it's been over 50 years. Radio just celebrated its 100th anniversary in November of 2020. So I literally have been a part of the industry for half of its life. Talk about feeling old, but gratified because it was some big fun along the way. You are intertwined with radio and actually intertwined with New England. Um, we, can you at, tell us, uh, in the early 90s, when did you first hear of Spooky World in Massachusetts? I was always looking for interesting and different people to talk to on my morning show. Morn in the Morning is what it was called on WCGY. And I picked up a suburban newspaper and I just saw this little teeny tiny story about this place called Spooky World in Berlin, Mass. So I read about it, got the phone number from directory assistance back then, 555-1212. And I got on the phone with David Bertolino and uh, we just connected because I like doing things that people don't expect on the radio and nobody would ever seen a theme park built around what David has done with it was Spooky World. So I got him on the air with me and uh, had him on from time to time. And before you know it, I'm wrapping up my career in Boston in a box underground at Spooky World. And we're going to get to that story in a moment. And we're going to leave the, the audience up to that because it's going to pay off. Sorry. In spades. <laughs> it's a no, don't apologize. It's going to pay off in spades for the crowd because as with everything, and we found out while doing this show, it's always the stories behind the story. And uh, I've always been fascinated with that. And that's why this format for us just it is a wonderful tool to bring us to the documentary this fall. Um, let's start off with it's 1994, I believe. Yes. And you made a call to David Bertolino. Tell us about that conversation with David and how this idea came up. Well, you're really asking a lot, asking me to think of a phone conversation, but I do remember very distinctly being intrigued by what he was doing. I saw a clipping in a small suburban newspaper back in the day when everything made the newspaper, and I thought, that's a cool idea. I need to call this guy and get him on my radio show, because I, I was always looking for guests that hadn't been really given any exposure yet. So I picked up the phone and got a hold of David in Berlin and talked about it, and before long... 
he was on my radio show from time to time over the next couple of years. So he's a very endearing character, I'll say that. <laughs> David's personality is is uh is effervescent, so to speak. And he uh he knows how to to construct an idea with someone who's just as passionate as him. Um so everybody knows that you're eventually gonna end up in that casket or in that tomb. Uh <laughs> at Spooky World in October, the road leading up to that. Why have I heard that this is not your first time spending a respite alive in a tomb? Could you please tell us about that? You have been doing your homework. Well played, sir. <laughs> or you're talking to my daughter, who's now 40, who was not very happy with me in 1989 when she was nine years old, the first time I was buried alive. It happened at a car dealership in Woburn uh, and it was to create awareness for recycling back, you know, many, many years ago. So what they did is they buried me in a box for 48 hours, a box barely enough for me to move around. I couldn't sit up in it. And they covered me with recyclable trash. And that brought lots of people out because who would be this idiot inside of a box. I'm not claustrophobic, so that didn't bother me. What did bother me though, is that the top of the box was, was hammered and nailed shut. And you know, had anybody tossed a match on that pile of uh, incendiary device there, all the, all the, the paper, you know, I, that would have been it for me. See you later. So uh, my nine-year-old daughter was there at the big ceremony, the kickoff, the press was there. And she, you know, understandably, you know, I was not dad of the year after doing that, but uh, that was the first time I did it. And, and it was fun. It got a lot of publicity and, and I felt that uh, it did call attention to uh, recycling, which of course now is what we're all about. Well, we do know that in 1989, nobody smoked cigarettes. So what could go wrong? <laughs> Oops, hadn't thought of that. And also she must have got one hell of a Christmas and birthday gift that year for putting her through that. <laughs> yeah, she still brings it up and makes me pay for it occasionally all these years later. Oh my gosh. So you did that. And did you do one before or after? Because I know you did that. I know you have a hat trick. I know you yeah, had three in you. I got the hat trick, and that's actually a really good analogy because the second one was on ice you know, as if a hockey game would be. So uh, beautifully said. So they, uh, the second time I did this, it was at a car dealership. And uh, as I recall, the charity, because we would collect money uh, for the various organizations, this was Special Olympics. And they put me in a 5,000 pound block of ice. It was like this massive ice cube. And they had to pull it with one of these like horse trailers to get it into the parking lot at the car dealership. And I was stripped down to just a t-shirt and shorts. And I went into this ice cube and I stayed there for 48 hours with almost no clothes on, which blew people's minds. Should I give the secret on how it was done? I, I please do tell because um, that's a, <laughs> I could imagine it was a chilly response when you got home. Oh, well, actually by then my daughter was a little older and she knew what a nut her dad was. So what they did on the inside is they hollowed out the center of it and they constructed a clear plexiglass box that would accommodate my frame. And I got in there and when you look through like this porthole or you saw it on a TV monitor, it looked like I was literally in an ice cube and people couldn't figure out how could this guy be in an ice cube with almost shorts and a t-shirt on? Well, one of the things, and I, I should have mentioned this for the first time uh, under recyclable trash, is I was hypnotized before going under so that I could overcome my fears of claustrophobia, which I had none. But uh, if I could just back it up, when I was buried alive in Woburn, the guy that did this, that put me under, Dr. Silkini, he wanted to demonstrate how this uh, auto-suggestion would, would help me. So he, he took a couple of chairs, he put them almost six feet apart, and I would, I laid my head back on one of the chairs and then I would put the heels of my feet on the other. So there was no support under me. Something, by the way, I could never do now <laughs> at this age. Head on one side, feet on the other. Told me to close my eyes. He's going through his little spiel as a hypnotist. And while he's doing that, I'm feeling just some very light touching on my stomach, but I kept my eyes closed. About 15 years later, I saw the video of this. The guy was literally walking on me. He was suggesting that I 
make my body rigid and strong like rebar and everything else. You know, I only weigh 140, 150 pounds at the time, and this guy is walking on me. So I guess hypnosis did work. It got me to the point where I could support the weight of somebody with almost no support behind my head or my feet. So the second time, the one in the ice cube was, was a similar situation, but I knew what was coming and I was, I was okay with it. It, it was fine. I, I didn't really need that much hypnotic suggestion to, to go into the ice cube. That's <laughs> all of this is just mind blowing. And that was the beauty of, of radio back in the day. Um, I think for a lot of our audience now, we're, we're speaking to ages, age groups uh, from 80 to 80 right now. So for the younger crowd who didn't have a chance to go to Spooky World in Berlin, and for the folks who may have the nostalgia and were blowing a little dust off the bookshelf for them right now, um, that was the beauty of radio back in the day. There was this creative freedom that you had, and that played right into the creative freedom that David had with Spooky World. And when you two joined forces, that was a, a brilliant event because you're working at um, WCGY, correct? That is right. And could you tell us a little about WCGY and some of its history? WCGY was at one time known as the Rock Garden, but in 1988, they brought in some really crack management. It was a, a diamond in the rough. It was in suburban Lawrence, just outside of Boston, but the signal had a pretty good reach all over the greater Boston area. So we began doing some interesting, you know, groundbreaking stuff. It was a classic rock station, and then it was album rock. And our, our primary audience, audience, our primary audience was roughly 18 to 34 males. And that's the best demographic to play to because they'll, they'll go with anything you say. You can drop F-bombs, although I didn't make a habit of it, although it did happen four times in my career, uh, including at CGY. But we could, we could do anything. So we could just let our minds go and think what would be kind of crazy that they would buy into, including one time I did the Urinary Olympics. But that's probably for your next production, not, not this one in particular. But yes, I, I, David had a great idea. He was ahead of his time. And a lot of stuff we did, I think, was ahead of our time. And so it seemed like a good connection, David and me. So WCGY is intertwined with New England, and it actually had a famous owner uh, that was known to the area. Who, do you remember his name? Oh, of course. How could I forget? He was a childhood hero of mine when I was growing up delivering newspapers in Detroit, and that is Kurt Gowdy, Cowboy Behind the Mic, I think was the name of his memoir. Uh, but he was certainly one of the classic announcers of his time, and he also owned a number of radio stations, including WCGY, Kurt Gowdy. That's where the call letters came from. And the great thing about Kurt is he wanted us to do whatever would, you know, make good radio. But he did have one, he did have one uh, favor he asked me when I started. He says, Mike, whatever you do, just don't get me in trouble with the churches. <laughs> Pretty simple request, if that's the only thing I have to stay away from. And I think that put me in a frame of mind to do things like Spooky World or any number of other pranks that I pulled during my eight years doing mornings, more in the morning on WCGY. That's amazing. Uh, it, it, all of these roads that lead back to such intrinsically New England people and icons. And you were a part of that history. You were part of one of the most infamous events that ever took place, Spooky World, and your radio career is absolutely amazing. So let's, let's bring us up. Now we're, the, fall, the leaves are falling. Uh, it's a little chill in the air, and it's October of 1994. Could you, do you remember the days leading up to the event? What, what was it like leading up to that event, planning it, building the tomb, and your anxiety? I mean, you, you're, an old, you're an old pro at it. But this was the first time you were doing it on a, in front of a large group of people with a high media presence like that. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good setup for it. Uh, of course, Spooky World had been operating for a couple of years up to that point and had really gotten a, a, a really good reputation and just packed every day for the month or so leading up to Halloween and beyond. Uh, what I recall, though, is the radio station owned by Kurt Gowdy had been sold a few weeks before. But David agreed that, yeah, let's still go through with it because it'll be fun and crazy and people know you and you're in this box. 
as you mentioned, I have done this before, and I knew that if I got to call how this box would be built, I would make it a little bit different than in the past. For one thing, I would not be nailed in. The first time I was literally hammered and nailed into the box, so I could not have had a quick escape if something horrible would have happened. So I also wanted the box to be a little bit bigger so that I could actually sit up because if you're on your back for 48 hours, uh, it, it starts to hurt no matter what your age. I was only in my early 40s at that time. So I designed the box, somebody built it, put it together. My producer at WCGY, Steve Gamlin, sat with me for 48 hours, stayed up with me, guarded it at night to make sure that nothing horrible happened. And I felt very comfortable, but of course there's always a little bit of apprehension because you just don't know what's gonna happen when you can't see what's out there and you're in this box. And there's a lot of crazies running around at Spooky World listening to music on stage because they were queuing up for the uh, the, hay, the Haunted Hayride right in front of the stage where there was entertainment that I got to listen to every night. Could you go into a little bit of that? I mean, you it was just you, a, a, a casket or a tomb, and just hearing the wonderful tunes that were being played by the incredible artists that appeared at Spooky World. Can you name a few of them? Do you remember them? <laughs> uh, I don't remember. Uh, I, I'm sure there were more than one, but I think the one national name that everybody will remember, and that is Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim came to fame with a hit song, Tiptoe Through the Tulips in the 60s. He then got married to Miss Vicky on The Tonight Show Live with Johnny Carson. Then, of course, the biggest point in his career was when he sang at Spooky World on stage a couple shows each night. And so I got to listen to Tiny Tim. Now, probably a year before that, not related to Spooky World, I got to interview Tiny Tim on the radio. A strange dude, no surprise there. Very nice, but he was a germaphobe, which of course is in vogue now. He was a germaphobe and all he wanted to talk about was the fact that he wore diapers. I do not lie about that. And he kept wanting to steer the conversation back to that. So being the good host that I was, we capitalized on that strangeness. <laughs> Indul in indulge us, as they say. <laughs> indulge us. <laughs> that's, um, that's quite the... Uh conversation to have with such a, a renowned celebrity did you ever anticipate it going that way <laughs> no not really but I, but I like it I like when I don't know what's going to happen I mean, that's why I do things like climb into boxes for 48 hours buried under trash or ice or or whatever it, it's because radio should be full of surprises and if I can be surprised well I'm pretty sure the audience will be surprised and that's what keeps them coming back. What will he do or say next? Not so much of that anymore, unfortunately, because of the corporate aspect of radio, but back in the spooky world days, David was on board with whatever happened, happened. I give him credit for that. Everything is so sanitized now. Uh, yes. And, and I mean, yes, I understand why in 2020 and 2021, it's not literal. It's, a, it's metaphorical that everything is so sanitized when it comes to radio, media, things of that nature. Um, the nineties was like the last great stand of that era and the creativity that came along with it, that you introduced to it, the, the ability to just sit in a room and be like, what are we going to do now to get people's attention? And you could go with it without having to go through 40,000 people to okay it. Um, and David had that same spirit. So as you're sitting in that box, do you remember how it was constructed? Because you told us how the ice box was constructed and you told us about the recycling one. Tell us what it would pull the curtain back a little for us. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, this, this was not exactly something you'd see on realtor.com, but it was larger than the first couple of boxes that I was in. As I recall, and I don't remember who built it, but we did bring it to somebody with some very specialized specs. And it just turned out to be some basic, it was probably plywood, but it was it was pretty sturdy. It wasn't going to be going anywhere. Uh, nothing fancy inside. There was a camera, of course, so that people could see me while they waited in line for the haunted hayride up on the screen where Tiny Tim or whatever was showing at the time. Uh, so there's a camera in there. And uh, the number one thing that people want to know in all three of these Buried Alive episodes, the number one thing people ask me is, how do you go to the bathroom? I'm surprised you haven't asked that yet. <laughs> 
I'm going down the list. We're, we're going. We're, I, I need to get you in the box first before I ask you how you're going to the bathroom. Did Tiny Tim give you any diapers to bring in there? <laughs> I'll tell you what, after about uh, 37 hours, I could have used one. <laughs> but no, Tiny, uh, did, Tiny never came over to pay his respects to me. See, people would walk by in line. It was almost like a funeral procession and, or uh, being at a, a funeral home. People would pay their respects. And there I was. And then there's tiny Tim up on stage. It doesn't get any better than that. So there wasn't much inside. There was like a, a really cheap mattress, as I recall. I had a radio because I had to monitor when I'd be getting called by radio stations. There was uh, no television, I don't think. And there was a camera. So, and I brought a book with me. I can't remember what book I brought. The first time I was buried alive, I brought the Johnny Carson uh, memoir because that came out right about the time that I was buried, but uh, I'm not sure what I brought with me this time around. So you were saying that the station got sold just before you uh, ended up doing this. What local radio stations uh, ended up carrying this and broadcasting it? Do you remember? I, I think there were a few that cut in because you had no more ties to exclusivity. You could, you could send it to whoever you wanted. Can we name a few? The only one that I really remember was Kiss 108, uh, Maddie in the Morning, Matt Siegel. And if you're going to pick somebody that's going to interview you, that's probably who you want because uh, Maddie had uh, amazing and still does amazing ratings. And, it, he, you know, he did it tongue in cheek. He understood that it was a it was a big goof. You know, nobody does this to better their career. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it pretty much ended mine. And, and Maddie was great. He um, and he and I have a little history that 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 goes back. I was kind of surprised actually that he uh, that he that he called me and, and wanted to do a, a routine with me. But uh, it was great, and it got some coverage in the local papers, uh, in the uh, the Eye or whatever that uh, gossip column was. The Inside Track, that's what it was in, in the Boston Herald. And then because it probably got put on the Associated Press. There was no internet at the time to speak of. Uh, I was getting a few calls from stations around the country. Again, a morning radio show has to populate its content with a lot of different things. And when you see something like that, it, people kind of say, what? what? That sounds like a train wreck. Let me listen to it. And, and Maddie had a real good touch for that understanding. He did. He did. And I believe Maddie for decades had the number one radio, morning drive show in the Boston area. So you help facilitate uh, <laughs> signal boosting your your moment in the sun or not in the sun underground at spooky world and uh how you were mentioning the people going by like a funeral procession did you lose count how many people were there well that's something that david might know uh <laughs> I, I really i really couldn't see very well outside but i could hear them I knew that the people were there. I could hear them cheering for Tiny Tim, and I could hear them. it was a party. It was a it was a long line party with stanchions and a and a star and and a guy in a box. I mean, it was just it was uh, I don't want to call it a train wreck because it really wasn't, but it was like wow, what what just happened? Was that an accident we just saw? What are all these things converging into one place called Spooky World? And David was not afraid to try anything and i love him for that that was the amazing thing you had that camera on you and it was being projected onto the karaoke stage so the entire crowd even if they were deep because there were so many people at spooky world that they couldn't get up front to everybody to see you do that and i have a sneaky suspicion that while you were doing that stunt that people weren't paying attention to tiny tim they were watching <laughs> you <laughs> because you know it, you know you could hear tiptoe to the through the tulips and there's no disrespect on that for 40 days but you how often do you get to see a guy stay in a tomb in front of you for 48 hours yeah a, a real person who's really in a box who's really under dirt you know i i guess i was every man you know i mean people what makes it crazy is people say oh no i would never do that now, there's certain things I wouldn't do. I would never parachute out of a plane. Uh, there's a number of things that people love to do. But because I'm not claustrophobic, I did something that most people could never imagine themselves doing. And maybe that was part of the attraction. I'm not really sure. That's amazing. And the funny thing was, I was speaking with David, and he had mentioned that just before he, you two crossed paths, um, he was in Florida visiting his parents. 
and he was driving by a stunt similar to this, much like that movie Used Cars with um, Kurt Russell back in the day. Uh, they were always doing some kind of a, a, a eye grabber. And he saw a rocking chair contest where people had to sit in a rocking chair for a certain period of time. And he said, that's brilliant. And then all of a sudden you come into his life. It's, kis it's kismet, as they say. So this amazing stunt uh, is never to be forgotten for Spooky World because the spirit that you have in radio and what you have done for 50 years, that's amazing. That spirit is still there. And the spirit is still there with David when I speak to him. And to know that you folks brought that to Spooky World and to the masses, it's one of the greatest stories of Spooky World's history. And I, I, I couldn't be more thankful for your time today, Mike. Thank you so much. What have you been doing nowadays? Well, I, uh, I did Morning Drive in New Hampshire at WZID, big, big station in uh, the Granite State. Uh, retired from that in 2014. Got dragged back into radio. No, I did it willingly at Frank FM Radio for a couple of years, in, uh, in also again in Manchester on four different signals at the time. But right now I'm returning to, well, this is the third book I'm writing, and it's about the history of the Red Arrow Diner, which is nationally known. It's been on diners, drive-ins, and dives, top-rated diner in USA Today. It turns 100 in 2022, and the stories that I'm uncovering, there's a movie for you. The, the people that were originally connected in 1922 and beyond, people like Paul Newman, people like Eleanor Roosevelt. So that book's out in, in uh, 2022, but I, I love uncovering stories. It's still kind of doing radio because I still have free reign. Nobody tells me what I can or cannot write. So you have less freedom in radio now, but if you're an author, sky's the limit. Thanks for asking. Once a creator, always a creator. And once a storyteller, always a storyteller. And that's the amazing thing about folks who have this calling to, to go into radio or to write. And to know that you're still doing it inspires me. Mike, thank you so much for your time today. This is a, an incredible story to tell and continued success. And I'm looking forward to that book. Thank you for the great questions. It was my pleasure to be a part of this great spooky world celebration. Good evening.